Danny Johnson is here, my friend of 29 plus years, and I am very happy and honored to be revisiting what we started 25 years ago as we sat in the basement Gold Hill overlooking the plains of Colorado and did a series of cassette tapes. And now, all these years later, Danny, what have you learned? I've probably learned how little I know. And um, every time I break into some interior understanding or experience or feeling, and the magnitude of that opens just to reveal how small of a place I currently occupy compared to what we will and are most certainly going to experience for a very long time after this incarnation. So that's what I've learned, is the vastness of all there is and the absolute uh, miracle of existence of life and the gratitude that I feel about it and the amazing opportunity it is to be a soul in a body experiencing feelings, increasing awareness, comprehension, having relationships. Uh, the vastness of it is staggering, overwhelming, and eternally increasing. Well, the entry point was the iris, and that's where we started, got to know each other, and it's grown and, and incorporated so many other aspects that I'm, I'm really hoping to get a flavor of that overview today and uh, go into more depth on these topics later in future videos. So the whole Iris teaching is just so vast and had such an impact on me. And where did it lead you past the original red and the original Iris material? Well, you know, my original experience of the Iris was a personal transformational moment. I mean, I had a remarkable experience that led me into the iris. Uh, my use or experience of the iris you know, is not bounded by any other knowledge about the iris. Iridology has always been for me a distinctly different field. Um, the iris of the eye for me has been always a you know, window into the soul, yes but also a deeper understanding of the relationship of my soul to my creator, how my soul came into the world, and gradually I'm learning you know, what is the soul, how does it function, what can I do to participate in the divine miracle that created uh, my existence. So for me, the structure of the iris is a mirror, a window, uh, sometimes a light. Oftentimes I've looked at the iris of the eye as the cathedral to the soul. And to be able to look into someone's eyes with a, a little light or to uh, look at photography of the human iris very close. I mean, there's remarkable opportunities to take up close-up photography and or to project someone's pictures on the theater size screens and to guide somebody up to you know, touch individual characteristics in the iris on the right eye or the left. Certainly when I first saw my own iris projected about three feet across on a screen, it was powerful. And then just, just that, even before going into the analysis of the different areas and pieces, we were just talking earlier about an experience you had when you had thousands of slides to look through with our friend Doug Thompson. When you were what you were preparing for a book, was that it? Or uh... well, Doug and I were actually looking at slides to make the very first iris chart. Oh, right. So we we had Classic. literally thousands of, of slides Ten Doug had taken. And part of it is um, 
What a remarkable thing to consider that the structure of the iris is in any way related to the human soul. I mean, you know, okay, you can see something about every person by looking at their skin, their face, but there's something about the iris that's ultimately compelling. So that's how I got into being able to examine individual people one at a time, tens of thousands of times one-on-one, -on -one. and it's a journey that's impossible to describe as the innate richness of looking into the minutia of the fiber and the individual positions in the right and left eye, realizing that there is a, uh, a template that is created at the moment of conception that now somewhat begins to congeal over a period of years. Some things are not there at birth. Mm. Other things continue to fill in, particularly between birth and eight. But by the age of 10 or 12, about 99% of everything that's going to be in the structure of the iris itself is now there. Now the rest of it becomes somewhat of a subjective interpretation about how that template is going to unfold over a period of years or cycles. And this template is nothing less than a memory package, that memory package being the composite of the unresolved feelings from the mother's family and the father's family meeting at the point of conception to transmit these feelings to now create this unique fingerprint of one person's iris. Now that self-examination potential of being able to learn the overall general map of what the constitution of the iris is and then to be able to objectively step back and look at one's own iris compared to all other irises. So you get to see how you fit into the spectrum of types. Right. And we began to realize that there were constitutional types. This is the spectrum of human experience. The spectrum of endless fingerprints of human experience unmetabolized experience though you're talking about memories that somehow didn't get processed or the only way I can describe it is you know God's mathematics I mean there is such a unique composite of a myriad of fibers and forms and shapes and colors in the human iris that actually reflect the qualities of the unlimited divinity that we have been imparted you know, so the creation of the, of the human soul is by itself what the iris is about. So for me, you know, without going into it in great detail, what's come after all these years is that the study of the iris is really the study of one's relationship to God. And what is this process? Where did we come from? By understanding any more of this, can we gradually become aware of what the underlying laws are that manifest the foundation and yet permeate the very nature of human relationships and ultimately the same pattern extends you know beyond disincarnation mm. that's how i see the iris as a entry point one thing about the eye is, is that um, of all of the tools and methods that i've seen and, and heard about the, the iris is so uniquely related to one's physical body and the soul's incarnation in the physical body. Mm. There are some intriguing things about the iris of the eye not changing. I mean, literally, after the age of 12, it hardly changes at all. I mean, we've taken thousands of before and after photographs and found out that there are things that definitely change under the age of eight, and we won't go into great detail on this, but there are definitely things that can change between eight and 12 or 16, but much past the age of 16, slight variations in color, but occasionally we get little tiny changes in one particular position, but no massive changes, and certainly we have not photographed any single characteristic of the iris actually leaving the iris. And you're looking for like 30 year before and after pictures yes. right now because this is sort of the holy grail 
of iris photography, everybody, many people believe, oh, if I fast long enough, if I breathe deep enough, if I, who knows what, drink aluminum-based soda water, uh, we will create a change. But it just hasn't been there in your experience, or very incremental at best over a long time. No, changes are, are really not there. Though you, you spoke of the Holy Grail of the iris, truly changing the iris would imply that one has come into real contact with one's own soul in order to get to the place where these characteristics are originally formed. Very deep personal patterns of which we, we begin to embody with every aspect of how we use language or how we express our feelings or postures or gestures or, or how we're attracted, the iris can begin to reveal body types and, and characteristic challenges that sometimes people don't even see coming for many years. So do people transform in the course of a lifetime? Does this imply that there's no real change or is it superficial or what's going on here? Brian, you know, um, I can only tell you what my knowledge is currently, and it's so infinitely small, I'll have to tell you, I'm not sure. I can only tell you what my experience is about this. What I know from the iris is that we are actually in the process of being exposed to the opportunity to feel, grow, comprehend, increase our awareness, and or not. We can improve the quality of the soul, or we can... Uh, you know, denigrate the experience of the soul. We, we, there's lots of things that can happen. We're not, it's not fixed that we will naturally get better. People have this thing, ah, we're just naturally going to go through life and get better all the time, and then we're going to be able to continue in some way or another. So I like to, as much as possible, move past the experience of the hopeful illusion of what's happening around me to the reality of what we can understand about the laws, about how it actually works. You know, because there's a whole lot of misconception, for example, about what the eye is. And I must admit, you know, I've taught things now that I'm not entirely sure were correct. I mean, what do we really know about the structure of the iris? Very little, actually, compared to what's probably there that we've yet to learn, there's a whole lot more. That I believe. So I, I'm you know, a little child describing some you know, monument of a mountain range, trying to describe a mountain range when I haven't been there yet. But you did say it's possible to improve one's experience or one's soul or both? I, I realize over the years I would like to prefer myself to be a mathematician. That is a divine mathematics. I would just like to know the actual truth of exactly what's happening, regardless of anybody else's subjective interpretation about what the reality is. Objective mathematical underlying what's of true, the laws, what's not true, what's ha really happening. You know, for example, uh, there are no little brown flecks in the eyes of children under the age of two. It's just not there. The jewels. So now we, we know that there are certain things that do and do not happen with the structure of the eye. And I, I don't want to do anything more than things that I'm fairly confident about. But there are some things that are not easy to be able to explain. For example, what I know from the structure of the iris is that the iris is a mirror of two other things. That is, a mirror of the spiritual body and a mirror of the physical body. So the iris is like a hologram, in a way, reflecting the entire body or the hands, the, the feet, and the blood cells, the DNA, and all of that. So that the structure of the iris reflects a spiritual body. Now, I've learned a lot more about what the spiritual body is, how it functions, how it relates to the soul, which is the largest of the things. And inside the soul, there is the spiritual body. And inside the spiritual body is the physical body. 
And so these are like interpenetrating fields that are both distinct and yet resonate and blend in some Yes, way. and they respond to different influences, uh, and they are regulated by different laws. For example... Interpenetrating laws that resonate, now do these tend to harmonize or not? That's based, that's based on what you bring. Well, if you would say that there are three different spheres... Okay. Then there's one more very large sphere, like a uh, ocean that surrounds a bubble, right? Okay. That ocean would be my experience of the divine, masculine, feminine, by any other way you can call it God, and that I am only a minute bubble inside of that ocean. So inside of that bubble, my soul is another individual pattern that I have that is unique to me, my mm. spiritual body, mm. which essentially operates at a different level of experience or vibratory rate than the physical body. Mm. So, for example, in the physical body, you might have a heart rate of around 60 beats a minute. But on the spiritual body level, it's about 600 beats a minute. Now, the different influences on the spiritual body is that the spiritual body can change in 28 days, whereas the physical body may take up to seven years to be able to integrate the experience of the changes. Mm -hmm. Now that time delay may seem agonizing, but in reality it gives us an opportunity to slow down the accumulative effect of our errors. It gives us an opportunity to be able to go Whoa, I am going in slow motion over a cliff. I might want to reconsider this on the way down. I think a hard right turn would be good. <laughs> or a gentle easing back on the throttle might be good as well. So, so it's a buffer. It's like a safety buffer. That's right. So uh, the interesting thing about the structure of the iris, it can predict which body parts are most likely to have mm. a long-term systematic influence. So that's how the iridologist or anyone else can work. You can look at the structure of the iris and based on the positions in the eye begin to translate, for example, the top of the iris being the shoulders up and the middle third of the iris right horizontal being right at the heart and solar plexus, whereas the bottom third of the iris being pretty much the area below the solar plexus down and including the hips. Now these individual areas uh, that you might see markings, they will correspond to locations in the physical body. Now interesting enough, these locations are primarily distributed and located through the glands. Now the glands are the, well, downloaders are the transducers of the experience of the spiritual body that operates at a different frequency or if you will, a higher vibration. So the majority of the markings in the iris are organized around the endocrine system, the glands. Yes. Which are like the interface point or the, the transducers, did you say? They're they're the they're the gateways. Well think of it this way. Points of in, points of intersection. Think of the pupil of the eye mm -hmm. and the first ring, maybe the first not even quite a third of the iris being a circle of glands. Mm. Now those glands the ones up above might be the pituitary pineal and the thyroid parathyroid, right. and then the other glands along thymus or, or spleen are those organs that are both gland and organ, like liver, gallbladder function versus the pancreatic function. Each one of the glands are actually gatekeepers to open up and dilate the experience of feeling. So they, they reside closer to the pupil and then everything radiates through them into the other structures and yes. experiences. They're the gatekeepers. The interesting thing about the physical aspect of all this is that the physical body is simply a binary code processing machine. By that I mean it is based on polarities. Yin yang, masculine, feminine, kind of sweet sour kinds of polarities and every one of the glands has two primary substances a couple of them have more than two, but they, they will transmit two primary impulses all the time. Like the pineal, it's serotonin, melatonin, you know, like you're awake, you're asleep. And every one of the glands has two primary little processes of polarities. So are we mapping the 
movement from the eternal and timeless, which may be the pupil, into duality where we exist? Sure, if you want to put it that way, you can, because there is a fountainhead of life force that moves out and comes through the iris and distributes itself through three different diameters. For example, one diameter is the gland, very small compared to the rest of the body. Right. Pineal is you know, no bigger than your little fingernail, right? It's a pea. But there is an organ, and then there is a organ system, and then there is a body system. Musculoskeletal. Well, see, there are ner 12, nervous system. 12 different body systems, uh, 12 different glands, right? 12 sets of organs that work in different ways in combination with other organs. It's a hierarchy. It's a hierarchy. So, gland, organ, body system. Got it. Small, medium, large. So, in the iris, it's gland, organ, body system in the three gates of the iris. But it's also proximity to the divine at the top of the hierarchy. That's correct. And now it has a, a pattern which goes basically out over the top and back again. So there is literally in the iris of the eye, there is an arterial system. There is an arterial venous system that transmits literally the blood through the eye and back again. So the whole iris is a living mechanism of blood flow. But it's also the vitality of the spirit circulating through and back into, from the source and back to the source. Yes, the vitality of the soul wow. transmitting through the spiritual body, mm -hmm. which transmits through the physical body. Got it. So the physical body is primarily a binary mechanism. Now the interesting thing about this opposite pattern is that you can take uh, bio, you know, biochemical things of minerals, vitamins, and so on, and you can tweak the body system using a combination of polarities. I mean, any good naturopath knows how to do this. Now, the allopathic world does this with you know, chemicals. They use drugs to, ah, this chemical is low, let's add in this one, let's do this one, let's manipulate the gland structure by giving you these other forms of molecular compounds. Herbalists do this with different herbs. They, do, they use one thing for the heart. They might use hawthorn for the arterial function of the heart. They might use rue for the venous function of the heart. And they're always doing this yin-yang thing. So if you come to me with a symptom in your physical body in some way, which is the result of your own choices, a good naturopath will go, oh, I get it. Now we just have to use these herbs here and these herbs here and give you these herbs and, ah, look, your symptoms begin to dissolve. Pay me my money. And then, okay, see you next month. But if you don't change your behavior that, that created those symptoms... Uh... This is the interesting phenomenon. I think that we can spend literally decades changing symptoms without ever getting to the original reason why we have the symptoms. Now, I'm not saying that it's unhealthy or wrong to do these things with the body because it takes years of wisdom and experience to take thousands of different body-oriented polarity tools. That means everything you can put in the mouth or everything you can do to touch the body, even exercise. It takes a long time to know how to begin to move all of these different systems well enough to circulate the life force to dissolve symptoms. The very good practitioner is capable to take any symptom of the body and be able to move the symptom. Now, if you can't find a practitioner to do that, I'd suggest you find another one. Because when they're really good, they'll know exactly which herb or herbal compound with mineral, vitamin, or so on. And they'll know exactly what kind of cleansing program or these things that you need to eat less of or more of to change your body chemistry so that you, quote, feel better. The, the current understanding a lot of people have is that the allopathic Western system just deals with symptoms. And then we get into more naturopathic and alternative systems that begin to address not only symptoms, but work with preventive or more causal. But in talking to you, I have a sense that there's another layer beyond that that you you're see, aiming for now. That's the, the sweet spot, right? Well, it's honorable and loving 
to know how to move symptoms. Each person needs to be able to understand how they actually created the symptoms. Because ultimately, in this paradigm at least, every single symptom does not begin in the physical body, it begins somewhere else. Now we have to see the link between the physical body and the spiritual body because the wave patterns coming through the spiritual body are actually from the distribution points in the spiritual body, which are by other terms chakras. The chakras are actually stimulating lines into the glands to create impulse. Now these impulses are creating everything that we know about ourselves we like. How we think, how we talk, how we move, but especially who we're attracted to. Because these biochemical hormonal messengers go, hmm, I like that one. No, I don't like that one. Ah, I'm going to play with her. Oh, she's special or he's special. So this produces something called the law of attraction. All it is is our hormones telling us to go somewhere, meet someone, and like someone because that particular experience will now enable you to speed up your symptoms. Creates more flow. Creates flow or it creates more challenge, right? <laughs> An opportunity to uh, well, look more closely. Well, the paradigm I operate from now is the reality, and this is a quantum leap for me, 100% of everything that's coming at me to produce through my law of attraction a feeling-oriented or emotional impulse or a dialogue or an experience of some kind, 100% of everything that's coming at me is only because of patterns I have within me. So I am the one who's involved in creating the attractions that are coming to me. Now, when these attractions come to me, they automatically produce a wide range of sensations and or over a period of time, I love you, I don't love you, and damn you, or whatever. I've actually married a couple of these attractions, right? So along the way, there's the experience of, yes, a highs and lows of ins and outs of everything we know to be the composite of our series of lessons that come to us. But to track this back, at one point you said, oh, it's just our hormones and endocrine systems interacting, but behind that are these waves from the soul or spiritual level that are informing the gland and hormone impulses. Yes, because if I have a pattern of someone comes to me and I have a, an anger, for example, and I start to feel, well, you are creating this anger in me. When the reality is, all you did was to trigger the anger I already had inside. But if I have a tendency to blame you for creating the anger inside me, now I'm violating one of those sacred laws upon which the foundation of the big bubble operates. Which if is? I, if I transmit an unloving behavior in due course of my reaction, so if I have an emotional experience that comes up for me, and I make you the reason why I'm angry, this is an unloving response to an emotional situation. And this shows up as, what, projection, blame, judgment, this kind of thing, even violence? Yes. It's all yes. violence in a sense. It's all vi Anything that's unloving is, is violence, to some degree or another. Now, the only reason that this unloving experience, I feel it, if I make that person responsible... Now I produce an automatic memory loop tape back to my own soul that actually links into an original pattern, comes through my spiritual body, comes to my physical body, and produces a gathering of symptoms. So over a period of time, how I'm responding to the world around me is gradually either clogging up or diminishing or overstimulating some gland, some organ, some body system, and so slowly how I'm handling the world is part of my process of what I'm experiencing that's killing me. So when we externalize, blame, judge, project, we're perpetuating and ultimately wearing ourselves down. Yes, and the the reality is if I'm this isn't this is probably one of the most important things. If I'm willing to accept the responsibility with some degree of integrity that whatever I'm feeling actually originated from inside me. 
So whatever you're bringing to me is an opportunity to see that what was given to me at conception needs to be felt. Because if I'm having an, an anger with somebody else, it only means that I received a pattern of anger at my conception. If I blame them for the anger, then that automatically sends a loop tape back to my physical body to cause damage. So help me understand this. I'm driving in my car. Somebody blows through a red light, hits me. The cop comes, the insurance company, everybody agrees it's their fault. But really, I created it. 100%. Where, so it was a, an indication that at some level I was out of integrity in my life. That at some time, somewhere, there is something that you're doing that's unloving or you would not have created the circumstances to create the accident. Your soul knew exactly what time to be there to meet that soul, to have that accident that looks like their fault. When in reality, I, 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 this ticket says it's their fault. Exactly. The cop agree, like everybody agrees. Everybody agrees. I, you're telling me it's me. <laughs> I'm telling you only what you want to hear. <laughs> so the process is, is that that, that original place, ah, now I'm suffering, I'm hurt, I have an accident, my shoulder, my body, or whatever. This is an opportunity now for me to recognize I can return to the original place where my impulses to create this attraction came from. So if I can now begin to return to the original place that my soul entered into this world and began to experience the true causal feelings behind why I have this repetitive pattern in the world. Now this pattern is repetitive because what we found is that there is a underlying mathematics in the timeline meaning that we will have, like the treads on a tire, will have cycles so of relationship Does attraction. the experience tend to magnify over time? If you don't get it at a subtle form, it gets bigger. If you don't get it then, it gets bigger and it ends up, you know, it could have been a stubbed toe, but you didn't get it, so now it's a, a car wreck. There are diameters of the experience and magnitudes of the feelings And does it felt. increase as the as it rotates? Does it tend to try to get your attention louder and louder? Is that yes, what happens? and there are many variations of it depending, no, it's not that simple. depending on how well you've processed the original experience of it. So you have a car wreck and the greater degree to which you're able to track it back to those original causal waves, the more you can do that, the basically the the cheaper your chiropractic bill is going to be. Exactly. So if you could just put on your spiritual vision sunglasses ah, and see the spirit body, right? Okay. You would see in the spirit body a whole series of little shapes, of little colors. And they're actually heading into the physical body in sequences. And these sequences match the flow of meridians coming up the toes and inside the body. So virtually... Everything that's arriving to your experience in the future, even 60 years later, is already pre-formatted in the experience of your spiritual body, which is pre-formatted by the existence of your soul. So now, now, how does this relate to birth order and generational realities of the fourth grandmother on the other side of the mountain? If you were to um, do something interesting. You could diagram 24 hours in a day by starting on the far left with a pattern at midnight and between midnight and 12 noon there's going to be six primary forces. These six primary forces, three before sunrise, three after sunrise, are the ascending masculine forces that are similar to the ascent of the sun. Now each one of these six masculine forces is directly related to a grandfather in the family tree. So six grandfathers, three from the father's side, three from the mother's side, and they will directly relate to, for example, number one, to the respiratory system, and all the way through, including the, you know, the lymphatic system would be involved, and the circulatory system would be involved, the digestive, the whole series of systems that these 
six ascending masculine forces. Now, if that corresponding great grandfather had a relatively healthy existence, then you'll pass through that time period and things will be good. If not, and there's an unresolved emotional pattern of some intensity that corresponds to lessons that he's not ever resolved that you're going to resolve, you now have an accident and exactly the right age that corresponds to that particular place in the ascending pattern of six different grandfathers. Now this is also the birth order system of six sons. So you can take the pattern of any one of the children. Now we're not really intending today to go into the topography of the birth order system and its relationship to 12 grandparents 12 body systems, because at 12 noon, you're going to have six descending feminine patterns. The ascending masculine and the descending feminine is like a pump. But now help me understand how it's a wave from your soul at the same time it's a wave from the third grandfather on this side. Is this an intersection? Are they holographically simultaneously existing? What, what's going on here? That if you received in the conception of your mother and father having sex to create the opening for your soul to enter, and when it entered, it entered into and took on the unresolved feelings of one particular grandfather. So that pattern now is part of your causal memory that's transmitting through your spiritual body a particular vibrational intensity to transmit into the physical body glandular impulses to create attraction to reproduce the same feelings the grandfather transmitted to you to have the accident. Now, now help me out. Maybe this is a stretch, but is this the same level of responsibility coming from the spirit and soul level that's creating that intersection with that grandfather, much like the two cars colliding in the intersection yes, because of you the would, street. You would end up, actually, your soul would know exactly how to break which bone in exactly the right position and to what magnitude the break should be. And which grandfather to incarnate with. Yes, the, 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 your soul knows exactly what time of the day uh, you should have the accident, what part of the so body you should break. miraculously break. detailed and <laughs> complex. I mean, the mystery of being able to interface the needs and awareness of the soul with the genetic and familial makeup of experience. If you stubbed your toe, your soul did it. Needed to do it. Yes, and there is a reason why we attract this. Now let's go back to the difference between the physical body, which is a binary processing unit, which we can learn to do, which is an honorable thing to learn to do to help people resolve symptoms. But anybody who does that kind of work with the public needs to be responsible enough to say, look, if you're having symptoms, sooner or later you're going to have to accept the responsibility that you're having symptoms because there are unresolved emotional patterns in your family that correspond to your spiritual body. Now the interesting thing about the spiritual body is where the mind begins. Science has not yet understood the mind is not inside the body. The mind exists in the spiritual body and transmits through the organ of the brain to produce this, this process of the projection of personality and choices and you know, sometimes we actually believe we're doing this with free will and in reality we're not, the spiritual body has a very different agenda because it is a, it is a vibrational area. So in medicines of different kinds, it can be a vibrational medicine. Like homeopathy. Homeopathy, flower essences, aromatherapy, acupuncture, acupuncture, anything that is of a subtle vibrational nature, including psychotherapy, symbology, breath regulation processes and imagery. There's a whole series of ones that can be done on the spiritual body level. Now, do you see that when a particular, say, conflict in a family happens, at the same time, a physical symptom will be exacerbated or arise? Yes, there is a correspondence to that. Or, if there is a physical or emotional condition that arrives in a family, 
it's not like it's always immediate. We may have to back up the tape to realize, ah, a few days ago or a few months ago, mm -hmm. something occurred that now this becomes these social dynamics. So there's different ripples intersecting at different rates, different echoes. That's correct. Under the age of eight, it's very quick. So what you see in small children under eight, you have to look immediately to what the parents are going through. So even childhood illnesses or childhood difficulties or behavioral patterns, any symptom occurring in a child under eight, you have to immediately look to the dynamics of the mother and father because they're the primary place right. that's regulating the experience. Right. But after eight, that starts to slow down radically. Mm. So by the age of 12, certainly by the age of 16, the parents have virtually no influence. And then that larger matrix starts to... Yes, now the child is operating from a discrete individuality. I'm reminded of a, I think it was a National Geographic story you may have read, but the original Polynesian navigators, they'd sit by the water and they'd watch the patterns of the waves for generations. And because of that, and they could count these things, and there's all these different rates of, that they'd arrive, they knew the Hawaiian Islands were out there because they saw a certain pattern in the wave that came from so far away. You think of the complexity of yes. all the wave patterns in the Pacific Ocean. There you have. There you have now the little bubble inside the big bubble. There you have that. Now let's back up one step further. We talked about the dynamics of the polarity nature of opposites in the physical body. But the difference is it's singularity in the spiritual body. So rather than opposite cures, it's like cures. So the correspondence is if I can bring my attention to the experience of the original feeling that's causing the symptoms, I have to re-experience the same feeling that's causing the symptoms. Versus if I have the right homeopathic remedy, everyone knows in that world is like cures like. Mm -hmm. So on the spirit body, it's an experience, and the primary way to experience that one is only through feeling. Mm -hmm. Except there is a challenging thing to get between the intellectual process of the mind, which cannot have a feeling, by the way, to, to completely become aware enough to be able to feel what the soul is actually feeling. And are we stepping out of duality into the unity, the eternal, the timeless, when we... So you're, are you talking about healing basically at a level that's beyond duality, at that level of unity? The only true healing exists in the soul. Everything we've described so far with all of the vibrational remedies and all of the physical remedies, they are only moving symptoms. Now this is the great illusion or the dilemma of the healer. You said the homeopathy works at that level. Of sure, it, it is so that's very, the beginning of... Uh, sure, it's very good for shifting subtle body influences so very quickly, the physical body can disperse a symptom, mm. but this is just the puppet master of symptoms. You can get very good at doing the spiritual body, and actually you've done nothing. You can do, do years of work on the physical body, notably a nice service to have, without ever actually having helped the person to resolve a single thing in their soul. And how do you get to that level? There's only one medicine for the soul. And... That is the increase of love. That's it. The only true medicine is the awareness of the experience of the feeling of the soul changing its condition through love. Now, is this an intellectual function or a function of awareness beyond intellect? It you is said the mind couldn't go there. The primary language of the soul is feeling. However, the experience of the mind when utilized clearly by the soul, because the mind is actually subservient to the soul. When, it, when it's in service. Well, in reality, ultimately, the soul is always dominant, ultimately. Until eventually, the mind becomes an organ of the soul, not dominant to the soul. But there is a reason for the experience of the mind in the spiritual body that now is the primary instrument by which the will is contained in some form or another. There's also the opportunity to express a free will process because there needs to be the 
incisive willingness to become aware of. The primary instrument of the mind is to point to something, but not necessarily deny it, object it, obstruct it. So we can't just not have the mind function. The mind is a process of being able to gain awareness. Now, the mind can also use simplicity and logic, because these are instruments that say, ah, now I'm beginning to comprehend the nature of the underlying laws that regulate my physical body, my spiritual body, and my soul. There are three sets of laws that regulate the body, the spiritual body, and the soul. When the time comes I drop my physical body, I, I don't lose my mind. I actually take my mind with me and I'm actually more aware because the last little glove of the body is taken away and the sensitivities of the spiritual body become more heightened. You said earlier the brain is basically just an antenna for the, the mind. That's correct. And so, but, but our whole culture, and most of us lead with our mind, but you're saying that properly used, by, by leading with the mind, we ultimately have to give up the mind, and through connecting analytically or through other processes, mental processes, it's going to lead us back to something beyond and higher than the mind. We cannot give up our mind. Some people would certainly like to because they don't want the responsibility to use it correctly. How do we subordinate it, though, in a healthy, wise way without giving it up, but at the same time not let it run amok or dominate because it seems to kind of cause some problems when you let it do that? What the mind is very good at is when trained to do so can begin to perceive that there is a greater picture and begin to experience a degree of trust in how the picture is unfolding. For example, let's go back to the soul part of it, for example. And, and there's a, you know, this whole place related to what is the soul. There are two discrete parts. If you might think of them like, um, like a sight on a, on a scope. You can see these two parts. There are two essential parts. I would call it simply uh, integrity and humility. Humility is the experience to dilate the soul, and integrity is the capacity to embody the firmness of the soul. So integrity is the capacity to hold, feel, and to receive and the humility is the capacity to dilate and to feel and to give even more. Both of them are primarily feeling instruments. But for the mind to become aware of how it works. For example, what many people don't recognize is that we cannot give away our integrity by giving away our will. Because a will is also an element within the soul but it has a derivative in the mind. So I can't give away my mental responsibility. I can't say, you know, I don't, I don't want to deal with this thing called the mind. I, I just want to do uh, God's will. So I want to understand this bridge. If I understand you correctly, integrity is the essential piece to healthy use of the mind. Yes. So but there how are, is, what's that rel and 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 then further this you mentioned trust how does that that helps the mind relax and become more humble expand and and to let the soul be more influential how do you develop that trust how do you develop that integrity to the there, mind there is um, a usefulness to understand the dynamics of how these two forces work because. These two essential forces we will be using for eternity. It's not just in the body. It's not just in the spirit body, which mm. is not for eternity. It is within the soul itself. Integrity and humility. That's correct. So I will be learning. If you think of, um, if you think of humility like a pinpoint, it is actually the pinpoint that begins to dilate my capacity to feel. I will be forever dilating my capacity to feel. So through the process of the humility, 
I'm increasing my capacity to feel not only the diameter up of it, but the fineness and the substance of it. So humility is the underlying phenomenon that I can choose to have within myself. Call it open-mindedness. It is an attribute of my awareness of my mind that I can actually choose. I'm going to be open-minded about hearing this. Now, many people would say that by um, giving it to God, they're being humble, but you're saying that's an abdication of the necessary function of the mind. So how does that square with being humble? Because we have to go back to the original experience for which the soul has entered into, through the conception, into this physical and spiritual body. What is the ultimate purpose for this? Now we have to go into open-mindedness for just a moment. To consider it, at least for the moment, that I'm going to be receptive to somebody's experience, because now I'm talking about something that's very difficult to physically comprehend or physically confirm. For example, the existence of a god, whatever her name is. Because there is a divine feminine, divine masculine from the paradigm I'm operating from, and there is a specific reason why the soul came in. And before the soul came in, it was created perfect. And we can go into the list of attributes that the soul has. And then there's many. I'll just go through a few of them. One of them is free will. Another one's desire, intentions. It has its own unique personality. It has its own unique creativity. It has a whole series of really individualized things and universal attributes. A universal attribute would be like free will. You have yours, I have mine. Then there are some specific attributes that you don't have, I don't have. I don't have your personality, you don't have mine. God created a fingerprint of a distinctive soul. Now part of that experience is the primary purpose for the incarnation is the individualization of the soul. That's why we're doing this. Through this process of going through the conception, this opening created by mother and father, I'm becoming individualized. And now my original experience of the perfection created by God, because God doesn't create mistakes, I enter in through this topography of the gene code of my mother and father. Now I take on this baggage. This baggage of unresolved genetic memories of my family tree and... Now I'm individualized, and the primary purpose for being here is to actually enhance and create a greater degree of individualization. So that individualization, in a loving way, God does not allow us to go, oh, I'll do your will. Well, guess what? God's will is that we lovingly learn how to use our will. We can't just say, I'll do your will. Well, God's will is... Learn your will. Learn how to be responsible for being involved. You remember we talked about the, the bubble? Mm -hmm. God's bubble is a bubble of love. Now, my bubble inside the bubble is a distinctly individual bubble. Now, the cool thing about that, and this is challenging to many people, is that when I come into the world, I do not have God inside of me. This is a misconception. Neither am I divine substance. I'm created as a creature in the world. Yes, very important, very beautiful, very loved creature. But I now have the greatest gift of individualization. <clears throat> and through that individualization, I have my own will. Now, many people would take issue with a number of things here. One is a common idea that we're here to return to God, that we're here to individualize and then sort of de-individualize. Another is that everything is God. The very nature of substance itself is supported by God. And a third would be that there is masculine and feminine aspects to God, but beyond that there's the absolute, the unmanifest, that's beyond any duality or polarity. So you're tweaking some beaks here. Yes, uh, and uh, um, I will make no excuses for that. Oh, well, and, deeper, and each one of these is an hour talk. And you know, they are. And uh, this is why um, it's so 
you asked me the question about the mind and the will and the, the function of it. Well, the first of it is to, in the integrity, is to begin to test or experience or feel what's true and what's not true. Because through the experience of embodying greater amounts of divine truth, there is an increase in integrity. As this integrity becomes greater and more enriched, and the humility is capable of being able to dilate it, and as we dilate our current integrity, we're actually loosening up those threads of things that are not true, and they're gracefully dissolving because of our humility, and our humility is increasing our capacity to feel, and our capacity to feel is actually increasing our capacity to love. Now, is integrity then the result of humility? Does it really begin this process of becoming more divine, of healing the genetic familial matrix? This all, this all seems, if I'm understanding you, to come through this point of humility and expansion. Our humility is an eternal experience. I will be forever increasing and dilating my capacity to feel. In order to do that and to take on a larger diameter, I have to let go of the bungee cords of false belief systems that bind me. Or whatever my level of comprehension was yesterday, I have to have the humility to be able to enrich it to the process of feeling. Now, I don't mean to disappoint you, but my understanding is there will not come a day where you and I are amalgamated into one place. All right, so what you're saying is that we may never become one fully with immersing and dissolving into God again, but we can become more and more capable of communing with that. So the ability to be able to say, oh, I get it. God gave me this little bubble and gave me the free will opportunity to experience that bubble. Now, part of that free will experience is free will. I'm now given the opportunity to use my own choices, my mind, my reactions, my emotions, to make choices. Now, whenever I make an unloving choice, there's an automatic feedback loop to basically cause some suffering in my little bubble. I read a piece uh, by Yogananda where he talked about having the free will to actually go back and forth over this edge of individuality and total dissolution or oneness with God. Is that outside of what you're talking about? Is that in error in your view? I don't have experience in that regard. No, I do not see a disillusion into God. And, and from my experience, I don't see that that is ultimately what God has designed us to do. God has designed us to receive this amazing opportunity of our individual soul to be in the world and to learn how to be in harmony with love. If I do something that is not in harmony with love, then there's an automatic feedback system to bring me pain and suffering. Well, and interestingly, as I recall the Yogananda piece, even when he was in his fullest communion or dissolution, there was some sense of himself being able to return to that individuality, that personality. Well, part of this whole process is the recognition that I have a choice to make. Oh, I get it. I'm a discrete, separated soul. I am here to learn about separation through separation. I'm learning how to have a greater integrity and a greater capacity to open myself to feel. So the feeling mechanism is primarily the capacity to feel through my heart and body and my ability to be able to move forward on a learning curve is my desire to take my awareness to learn through truth. Now, as I choose to learn truth, now interesting things begin to happen. Because as I choose to learn truth, oh, well, I get it. God is not inside me until I choose by my free will to ask for divine love to enter my bubble. Because until I ask for divine love, 
there still exists a place where I'm free not to use divine love. Now, I can do remarkable things with my free will because God has endowed me with the capacity of free will and desire and awareness and the capacity to be able to make choices, have intention, and even to love. Now, I can choose to love my friend. I can choose to love my friend. When I do choose to love my friend, this is a love that flows from me to you. That's a love between two people, but it's not a love from God. As I choose to put myself in harmony with love, then my capacity to feel love increases, and the capacity of my soul to, uh, to increase its condition of love increases. And so can we get to the place where we are vehicles for God's love and experiencing and circulating that between each other, or does it never... It is perhaps the most essential question we ever resolve. Do we want to do that or not? So we can choose. That. We can choose. It is the single most important choice that any soul ever makes. And what do you suggest? There are two forms of love. All right. Natural love, which is the love that flows between you and I. And in the process of doing that, I can go, okay, the loving thing to myself is be, I accept the responsibility that drinking alcohol kills brain cells. I'm not going to damage myself anymore. So no more of these substances or those things. Oh, I get it. I'm no longer going to hurt anyone else by intention or action. I'm not going to throw rocks or blame. I can go through a myriad of physical tools and spiritual tools. I can visualize. I can breathe. I can do mantras. You, I can go on and on and on. I can do my postures. I can get better. I can get better. I can get better. I can keep improving. This Self-improvement is natural love. All right. It is an honorable and important part of it because eventually I have to accept the responsibility for what I put in my mouth and I have to accept the responsibility for how I do treat other people. But the improvement of the soul is different than the transformation of the soul. The transformation of the soul is through divine love and the only source of divine love is from God. So in order to receive divine love, I have to ask for sincerely now to receive something that I've never had before because I was born without divine love. With the capacity to be able to receive it, yes. But until I choose with my free will that I want to receive divine love, and divine love is delivered through the spiritual funnel of Spirit. It is a Holy Spirit. It's how it's delivered. Is it, in some sense, the difference between personal and impersonal love that we're talking about here? I think it's highly personal to have a one-to-one uh, -one relationship with God. Now, we, the interesting thing about this process is that the individuality of the soul, the essential purpose is... I have to begin to examine that what is really important to me is a one-to-one -one relationship with God. So I have to eventually choose that I'm no longer going to have a mediator of person, guru, master, pope, priest, bishop, anyone else between myself and God. And any other belief system of any form that is inconsistent with the reality of God's laws rather than man's laws. So the one-to-one -one relationship to God is one I have to choose. And you have to figure out and find your own fingerprint unlocking mechanism to develop. Well, it isn't so much find or figure out. Okay. Ask. Part of this process is, okay. To get some help in... Uh... The only true way for me to find the unresolved feelings inside my soul is with divine help. Mm, and that's the difference between soul improvement and soul transformation. That's correct. So I have to say, okay, I get it. You want me to accept the responsibility for my own integrity. 
God doesn't want me to give away my will to God. God wants me to develop a stronger love of my own soul because being a soul, being created by God, is a divine treasure. Thank you. I get it now. Now I want to begin to recognize in order to increase my capacity to feel God more, I have to develop this continuous experience of humility, the continuous experience to open. So this soul transformation, in a sense, is a co-creation with God. You have to ask, but you're still there as an active part of it. The active part of it is for me to exercise my free will in harmony with love. That's the only thing I can really do. Is in harmony to, with God's love. With God's love. God's the purpose. Bubble. The big bubble. So the more I operate in harmony with love, the greater my diameter or magnitude of my experience of my capacity to feel. So this communion, this connection, this relationship, personal one-to-one -one relationship with God is really the whole ball of wax here. This is what it all ultimately moves toward. Yes, because everything about this is my individual soul now comes in, develops a spiritual body and a physical body, goes out into the world, creates these attractions to experiences, and now by my law of compensation, I'm having emotional, physical damage or benefits, depending on how well I harmonize with love. And any time I'm out of harmony with love, it's circulated back to my soul, back through my spiritual body, into my physical body, and my physical body is either deteriorating or, or getting better. Now, these different belief systems, whether it's a religion or a method, or a, so, they've got to be useful to a point. When do you let it go, move past it? When does it become harmful and a, uh, an obstruction to this one-to-one -one relationship? And when is it helpful? And how do we know the difference? Boy, there's a mouthful of questions in that. Well, there's one question, which is, you know, charting our own path in this journey toward the one-to-one -one relationship, we've got all kinds of religions and people purporting to be able to help, but in fact intermediating and perhaps at a time standing in the way of our, that relationship. You know, I don't know about most religions. I'm only an observer of them from the outside of them, and I've been involved in, in several and there are thousands of them. I, I think at the last count, there were 3,000 different religions or more on earth. And well, there's, there's 30,000 sects of Christianity. Okay, so there's 30,000 versions of just Christianity. Well, maybe it's 35, I think it's 35,000. Part of this process is the underlying uh, faith in God which is probably the ongoing experience that we develop as we have a willingness to have a one-to-one -one relationship. And that's based in that humility. So really, humility leads to faith. You can make an argument that's faith to humility, but I'll take it either way on that. I think they're simultaneous at some level. Uh, they they co-emerge. Faith and humility, they're probably the most significant Part of this process is that we develop a underlying sincere relationship to God by having a one-to-one -one willingness to dialogue. And this dialogue in some form or another is prayer. So humility, faith, prayer in some degree or another. So we could take a fine line about what prayer is because there are many different ways, if we will, to pray, but ultimately the sincere, heartfelt desire by the soul to increase its harmony with God and the laws of love are experienced by God and hasten or increase the divine love that comes to the soul. Now here's the interesting part. In order for me to be able to receive divine love, I need to have the humility and the willingness to become self-examined enough to be aware of and to feel anything inside me that's not love. So when somebody comes at me in the car accident or something, 
Now is my opportunity clearly to blame this other person because they violated the law and ran the red light or whatever, but I'm going, huh, this is my opportunity to recognize that something inside me needs to be felt. Now I turn away from my tendency to want to blame the other person, turn back into my experience of going now, God, show me from inside me where these feelings are coming from because there are some things that prayer and God will not do. For example, if I pray to remove a disease, for example, God will not answer a prayer like this because every experience of a disease is a direct result of my unloving actions. Well, there's divine intervention, so there's got to be exceptions to that. But... Mm, divine intervention would be the experience of showing me where the original feelings are inside me that I can Feel Unlock. the feelings uh, and then dissolve the disease. So that's grace. That's grace. Uh, grace is because I asked to be shown where these feelings are. I'm now in. You're in inviting obedience. it. It's back to that asking for divine love. Yes. Divine, so. But now there comes a series of other experiences. Part of this is because of the original damage in my soul, I developed a personality pattern I liked about myself. It has various degrees of addictions and facades now, and is, characteristics. Is it in your soul or uh, it's an overlay? Because your soul retains its perfection, as I understand your model here, but there's an overlay or that winding of... You might consider that there is a, a original, pure soul that received these inlaid qualities of causal damages or injuries from the family tree and, and the... The reason that this is set up is as I experience each one of these and uh, or am obedient to the laws of love to experience it through my feeling mechanism without attack or blame or disharmony, the elasticity of my soul actually increases as I process all these feelings. Uh, because now, this, is that soul transformation or soul improvement? Well, as I release the experience of the unresolved feeling, divine love enters. Okay. Now, divine love is permanent. What divine uh, love does is change the degree of love mm -hmm. in my soul, and it changes the substance of my soul. Ah, uh, so that's the actual transformation. It changes the nature of the creature that I am now. And so the humility and the faith supported by integrity and trust lead to the actual soul transformation, creating a different divine substance incarnated in our souls, or just in our souls. Yes. Now, in the process of doing that, I become aware of that my personality has been putting out certain patterns since I was about the age of four, which means that, oh, now I get it. I have been using my will since about the age of four to produce choices of throwing a rock at the other little boy or whatever else it might be, right? Yeah. That I've been engaged in some kind of unloving behavior for many years. The result of that unloving behavior is all categorized and remembered by the soul and transmitted back into my physical body to accumulate as symptoms. And that sincere examination of that is a mental function. Yes, the willingness to become self-examined. Ah, now... And that's the mental function in the service of the soul. Yes, and to be able to accept the responsibility that, hmm, now I'm examining more acutely how these laws operate in the social or physical world. Now, here's the, the challenging part of it. I have to, again, this key word, in integrity... I have to accept the responsibility that I've been broadcasting higher and higher diameters of unloving behavior as I've gone through the world. For example, in my case, my relationship with my father wasn't you know, the most loving, so then gradually my symbols of authority was you know, the man down the street and the teacher at school or the coach or the policeman or you know, the governor or you know, the 
the president or you know the, the church and the, the diameter of it of, of masculine authority just keeps getting bigger a lot of opportunity to blame people there a lot of opportunity to blame the big yeah. systems of the world the yeah, banks, yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. insurance companies the big you know Monsanto's none of it of the world. really has anything to do with the essence of it that's correct now I have to recognize ah oh, I have been Angry at these systems and angry at God for a long time. Right? Ah, I get it. I am the one who's been transmitting the damage by my anger and my aggressiveness, my intolerance, my impatience, my arrogance. I am the one who's been transmitting it to all of them. Ah, now there's two sides to this. The part of the responsibility for what I've transmitted versus the responsibility for what I've received. For what I've received from someone else, primarily my mother and my father and my family tree patterns, I forgive this through the feeling of it. So I forgive my father because I feel it. Or do you have any responsibility for what you're transmitting in terms of any suffering or damage created? Or is that exclusively the responsibility of whoever's on the other end? Now, well, two sides to this. One side is, yes, I need to go into my pattern with my father, which, by the way, we won't be done for a very long time. We'll be gleaning and mining this experience of mother and father pain for a very long time. Then I come back out and go, look, ah, I get it now. I've been transmitting unloving behavior for a very long time. Now, this will bring up lots of different feelings like shame or guilt or hurt or despair, hopelessness or whatever. And I need to accept the responsibility of the magnitude of the damage I've caused others. Now, this damage, by the way, is like a huge aerosol that I've been spraying around <laughs> since I'm four years old. And who knows where the derivatives of this 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 broadcast of pain has gone to. I don't think I like the smell of that aerosol. <laughs> it's... Well, <laughs> the only way we deal with that is the same way we deal with the one on the inside, we ask. For the divine aerosol of love. <laughs> we ask, show me, reveal for me. Reveal. Show me all of the suffering I've ever caused anyone. I remember the title of your first book, What the Eye Reveals. Yes, it's a... It's, uh, Show me. Reveal this inside me. It's not just a matter of, oh, by the way, would you hurry out and take care of all the aerosol of the damage I've done? I, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to feel it coming back at me. But the reality is, is in order for me to accept the responsibility, I have to feel all of the damage I've transmitted to anyone else. Then comes the grace of the forgiveness to repair the damage. I have to be willing to feel it. So that's the single focus that most rapid, the sincere willingness to feel is the single most effective focus for returning us to that communion with God, that experience of divine love. That's correct. And there's two sides of that. One is I need to feel all the damage I've transmitted with a deep, sincere desire of, geez, I don't want to do this anymore. And if I have transmitted a belief system about something that wasn't true, that's damage. If I've done something with somebody else that was controlling, even though if I didn't know it was controlling, no matter what I've done, whether I've known it or not, it's not just the things I know are damaging. It's a lot of the things I've been involved in that are damaging that I didn't really recognize the magnitude of the damage has caused everyone else. For example... I'm not really aware of the magnitude of the damage I've caused everyone else by my addiction to driving a car or my addiction to my cell phone. Because the reality is, if you really examine the nature of the car and the cell phone, you realize that they are toxifying in some way or another. In order to drive a car, I have to have all these chemicals. I have to extract these fuels from somewhere else. I have to enslave somebody else or cut down forests or whatever in order to have a cell phone. Somebody in China has to work in a sweatshop in, this, in order for me to have this instrument of my leisure and so on and so on and so on. Whether I know it or not, I'm still engaged in the process of 
supporting systems on Earth that are virtually unloving. And that's the first of the two. I have to accept that. So, okay. So that you, I'm engaged and feel, and in... And feel that. That's correct. In some sense, metabolize it. That's correct. And to recognize all the way back from the very large, like we're talking about global systems, back to myself, ah, each time I am unloving to anyone else, I've damaged them and I've damaged myself. I have been unloving to myself by doing something that's unloving. And you said there were two levels here. One is the... The acceptance of the responsibility, which involves a sincere remorse that I don't want to do that anymore. Now, this process, by any other term, is repentance. Sometimes that's a word of reaction to many people because it brings up all kinds of religious connotations. But this is the reality of the mechanics of the law, is I want to accept the responsibility. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm asking for divine help to show me, inside me, the feelings I have damaged within myself and somebody else. Now, the second part of that is, I accept the responsibility to return to the place inside me where this pattern of behavior came from. To the source. To the source of my causal feelings inside me where I'm going to need help because I might have some memories of my childhood. So we're going to need to ask. That's the point of ask, using your free will to ask for God's help to That's correct, return because to that source and be able to metabolize that as well, which completes the, the whole continuum Yes, from the external to the internal and heals that vector, that particular experience. I need help to feel something I have no memory of. I mean, I can see patterns of my relationship to women, patterns of my relationship to men that all lead back to my childhood and my father, and I can forgive my father and forgive my mother and all of that, but eventually there comes a place where I have no memories. Yes. Because the majority of the causal feelings were transmitted to me genetically, and I don't have the memories of my great-grandfather and great-grandmother. Precognitive stuff. Precognitive stuff. I go, God. Using my free will, I'm asking to show me these feelings inside me that I might be able to feel them and through the process of feeling them, permanently dissolve them as the divine love is coming in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now the difference between divine love and natural love is natural love can go up and down because that's the wave pattern of natural love. Now mm -hmm. the danger in... Natural love is I can have, I can have these processes of very personal uh, causal feelings inside of me. But if I gain enough self-control, I can actually keep my control mechanisms controlling the feelings and controlling myself by techniques. So your your ego is still in charge. The ego is still in charge. It has not not really gone to the divine level. Yeah. So I'm either going to be a Gradually improving my love, my condition, gradually improving it. By the way, the nature of how we do this now begins to already point us to where we go in the spiritual world when we disincarnate. If I engage in, look, I want to do this by eating my organic food, <laughs> I want to do this by doing my exercises, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go off to these retreats, and I'm going to do these meditations and all the stuff. I'm going to do my Tai Chi and my Qi Gong and all these processes. I'm going to get this right by my own sense of will. If we were to disincarnate at that moment, the force of that continues in the spiritual body, and like goes to like. Mm -hmm. We will automatically be attracted to a community. Oh, by the way, there are communities. We're not all wispy pieces of smoke. There are communities in the spiritual world composed of people who are actually in the same condition of love I am. So Everybody is, thinks alike. So what is the right use of free will? The right use of free will is anyone's choice to use that free will. But back to this asking for help. So to get out of this ego-based natural love, to, to transcend that, to move beyond that, we have to use our free will to, informed by humility, to 
accept and open to that divine love. That's correct. So the process of the humility is, ah, oh, there's a lot I don't know. I want to grow. I want to feel. I recognize that through the law of my own choice, I choose to open myself to feel more. I want to feel by my intention and my desire. I want to feel all the feelings inside my own soul. That's humility. Now the interesting thing about humility is it is not a process for most people of sublimation. It's not a process of going down. Humility is a process of the upwelling of the capacity to be able to love more. Humility is actually the increase of the capacity to feel. And through the capacity of feeling, it increases capacity to love God. The experience of divine love is to receive the divine love from God down into the integrity of my soul. So the integrity and the free will work together. Free will, I have to choose. I want God's love to be with me, to show me all the feelings I am in denial of, because the most common interruptive process is my denial. I'm in denial of the things I hold to be valuable belief systems are actually untrue. Show me the things that are untrue. Show me the things that are true. I want to feel. Now, when we do this, where it comes from, generally, is from outside of us. So right away, as we pray for the increase of divine love, we accelerate the law of attraction of people who start to arrive. Now people will come and we will find, by our interactions socially and dynamically, at the street corner where the accident is, we now have the experience of spontaneously, you know, either going into a rage for this person who's obviously, you know, violated, quote, the law, or, thank you, I got it, and I'm having a feeling. That's an expression of integrity with humility. Now that triggers me to feel something. What's the, what's the relationship of integrity to this? Uh, how is the integrity and the humility? Because that's a, a key word. The integrity is the embodiment. The capacity... The integration. To, the integration of humility. It's like the cup. The cup has a capacity to be filled. This is the integrity of my cup. Now, if I want to go higher, and by the way, there are literally mathematical levels of these spheres that we can go to. If I want to go up to the next sphere, which is 10 times greater in the magnitude of love than the one I'm in, because each sphere is a magnitude of 10 like the Richter scale, the only condition is, is that the integrity of my cup needs to be capable of going into that level without falling to pieces, and my capacity to feel that level means I have the capacity for humility and feeling. So how do we develop integrity as succinctly as possible? How does that develop? By the exercise of free will. Used? In harmony with love. To ask for divine love and help. Part of the, the thing that is most intriguing about this is the um, use of free will to lovingly enjoy separation. Because it's through the process of my individualization, through separation, I mean, so many people around us are desperate to get out of separation, whether it's separation with somebody else, or you know, a union with somebody to meet somebody, do something, have a relationship, feel better, feel different or to get out of the world, I don't want to be here, depressive tendencies, or I want to go to God. But the truly loving acceptance with gratitude that my individuality is through my separation that I'm going to accept the responsibility to make choices. And one of the most important choices is, what am I going to do in the world? What is my passion? Because every single soul automatically is conceived 
before the conception process that every soul has at least one or many more forms of individualized passion that no other soul has. So if I'm willing to find my passion, that now becomes the verb that propels my ability to be able to go in the world. Your individual expression. So the integrity is me finding my own passion. Who am I? What is my passion? So for example, I might have a, uh, a little love of just unusually, I like to carve little boats, for example. I just love carving little boats. And my, my mother looks at me and says, no, wait, what are you doing? You're going to the university, you're going to be a doctor. Your father's a doctor, his father was a doctor, you should be a doctor. You should really be a doctor. Stop, right? stop carving those Stop boats. carving those silly little boats. It's not going to get you anyway. If I give away my will, which many of us do, we, we don't do the thing that's intrinsic to our own soul, I've lost my will, I've lost my integrity, I've lost my way. Now, if I stay with it without getting angry at my mother, which, by the way, I have to then go into repentance for, if I make my little boats, and I just make the perfect little boats, right? And I just love my little boat because I'm in my passion as a soul. You come along and go, there's something about this boat I like. Wow, can I put your little boat on Facebook? Now, guess what? Pretty soon, my, the pictures of my boat are selling everywhere, and people want my little boat, and I just do my little boat, and I'm getting rich. This is how the passion of the soul turns into joy of the heart and prosperity. I need to find my own passion. Now, here's the sad part. Well, maybe not sad. God doesn't tell you what it is. You can't go, yo, God, what's my passion? Now, this is the process of integrity where one has to make the choice, I want to do this. But you also have to make the choice to connect with and open to divine love, which is helping you develop the integrity and ultimately connect with your passion. That's correct. So as you are connecting to the divine love, and you find this thing, okay, I have an interest in music. Oh, I think I want to play the flute. I've got a job. I'm, you know, working at Burger King or yeah. whatever else. I used to love playing the flute. My mom told me to stop it. She right. sold. She sold my flute. Yes, yeah, sold the flute. Whatever. And I'm, I'm still upset or angry about this or whatever. But the reality is, many souls have the capacity for music. For example, that's a passion for many souls. But inside the music is all kinds of instruments. I may have a particular love of flutes. I may have a particular love of the Indian flute or the recorder or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that is unique to my own passion is the music I make. So if I'm playing my flute my way with my soul, then the passion that's moving through me is actually accelerating the increase of divine love. But now if you're playing Mozart, can you play it in your own passionate way that has that sure. same accelerating quality? Sure. If, if, if it's my passion to play Mozart, then that's my passion. The interesting thing is, it's my verb into the world. Now, as I do my verb into the world, it's bringing a passion and accelerating the increase of divine love through me because... I'm using my free will to be in my passion. That's, That's why it's important. So this thing about increasing the flow of divine love by connecting with your passion is very purifying, healing. It is extraordinarily important. That's why we have to be utterly respectful of any child's interest in something on the floor. So if we've been, you know, disconnected from that, what is the key? to reconnecting with our passion in order to be able to, you know, using humility, asking for divine love, is what is the nexus point here that the, the fulcrum that returning to the authentic passion requires? I think it's the same thing all the time. Humility. In, increasing divine just, love. I get it. If I just allow myself and I ask for the increase of humility, and I can, I can ask for the increase of humility and feel. I can recognize that I'm beginning to open up myself to receive more love. I can ask for the divine. I want more 
divine love. Because here's an interesting thing about this, for those that have, have not really tried this, you're not required to understand what God is. You're not required to exist in this world with a cornucopia of religious umbrellas and to know which one you need to follow. The primary thing is, is to be able to say, look, yo, God, I pretty much believe I'm a soul. I'm not sure where I came from or why you decided to make me, but I do believe that you're out there somewhere. And you know, oh, by the way, it's really confusing. There's lots of different things, umbrellas, and there's lots of misinformation. There's lots of popcorn around when I'm looking for manna. And oh, by the way, I'm a little pissed at you anyway because I don't like this system. As long as we sincerely say, this is how I feel. This is exactly how I feel with no hiding as a truly transparent willingness. Now, if you're there, I would like to know. You're my creator. I'm, I'm your creation. I'm asking for a direct experience. I'm asking for a direct experience of divine love. I'm not going to try to understand everything here. I just want to experience divine love. Love. This is the grand experiment you ask. Now, subsequent to the asking is the experience of watching what's coming, accepting the responsibility, no blame, taking the feeling back, forgiving the processes of where you receive it, you know, and then... That's that whole internal, external that movement. Whole process moves. But that seems to, to come to another higher level of internal, external, which is divine love and expression of passion. Yes. So that when you, yes. you start at this one level, and you, must, you kind of floss that yes. continuum for a while, yes. then it starts to open up into another level of this expression and experience. And it's, it's as if God is expressing and experiencing through us, and we're expressing and experiencing God all simultaneously. And then we have a little tiny noticeable urge to do something. Maybe I just notice out of the corner of my eye a book on you know, wood flutes. Oh, wow. Then we have to be aware enough to recognize that our law of attraction brought us to the place exactly to see this book on wood flutes. And that's a potential. Notice that because we have there's, to a notice potential, every... there's a potential to express an experience through that. Because here's the cool part. As I'm willing just to observe, okay, I want to know what my passion is. I'm walking down the street, and I, and I just you know, glance over to my right, and there just happens to be you know, something really beautiful about wood carving. I just, wow, I just I picked that book up. Then, even if I just read through it, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm looking for my passion, I may actually put that book down, because right next to it is the one on flutes. And I kind of like perk up a little bit. You know, I... I I've always liked those Native American wooden flutes. I, I would just like to, you know, and I, I, I drop back and I go, ah, you know, I'm probably no good. I, I, I uh, probably can't do it. I, I don't know if I can afford it. How much do they cost anyway? And I can hear all the dialogue of my fear, right? Yes, yes. Which is an unloving attitude toward myself or right, the situation. Right, right. I have to observe that this is my law of attraction about myself because my passion is about me. So regardless of all that, there is an attraction. And I just move, as I move forward, then this lava flow of passion starts moving through me, right? Mm -hmm. And now that lava flow of passion is not singular. It can be several things. You know, I just, I just, I like the idea of this cooking in the wok. I've, I've always wanted to cook, you know, in the wok. I want to just want to do... So we create a tapestry of passion. A well, tapestry that, of that, passion. That, right. Like rivulets of lava combine into a larger flow of divine love. And here's, here's the fun part. I might go off to this cooking class of cooking in the walk because, you know, I can do this walk stuff. And as you go into the walk class, you just notice there's, wow, isn't she beautiful? And this kind of electric thing happens. You got to your soulmate as a result of following your passion. There's a piece in, in Rumi that I love where he says something like, God plays this switching game. You think you're going to Tashkent to become a silver merchant, but you end up in Samarkand selling rugs. The point is to take that first step, 
to begin the journey because you may not know where you're going to end up, but you're not going to get there if you don't start. This is called taking action, following your passion. And that's part of the process. Now, this opens a very essential, very real gate in the integrity. So the integrity is my capacity now to open up and embody the reality of my soul because I have chosen to step in the world with my passion. Now, here comes a series of tests. And there are a series of layers of tests, each of them having diameters, all of them relating back to the glands. Because I'll have glandular tests at the bottom and the middle and the top, and there is a series of lessons. So can I go into the world, I'll just give you an example, at level number three, with integrity on one side through truth, can I embody truth while embodying integrity through wisdom? So can I come into the world and do my own passion without denying or interrupting your passion? Can I go forward and do something which is now congruent to my own passion without in any way being unloving toward anyone else's passion? Yes. I mean, this is another magnitude of the lesson. And it sounds like it's inevitable that by playing that flute or carving that little boat, you're going to heal a certain gland or vector. Yes. In the process of doing that, I, I actually change my own self-image, which, by the way, has to do with the the basal, right at the hips, because the, the most significant of these is at the bottom of the spine. The bottom of the spine has to do with integrity and humility. So if I don't have enough integrity in some form or another, or I'm not loving myself enough, the foundation of my entire vessel begins to collapse. So self-love, feeling appreciated, feeling love within myself, you see, the bottom of the ladder, the first two rungs of the ladder, are only me and my relationship to God. That's all it is. That's the only place that's important at the bottom of the ladder. Who am I? Where have I come from? How do we have a better relationship? As I begin to do that, I feel more. Divine love comes. Greater integrity. As the integrity builds now I come into my passion, which is my step into the next level of the ladder, which is how am I going to go meet somebody else with my own passion. But before I can go in the world with my passion, I have to have an increase of my capacity to open to love more and to receive love of the divine nature. That's the integrity. The integrity is now I have a bigger cup. Well, interesting that at the bottom of the ladder, it's you and God. But then a while ago, ultimately, we were talking that the whole ball of wax is communing with God, that ultimately that's what it's all about, that individual experience of and communion with God. That's correct. And the experience of the ever-increasing part of that is I have to use my integrity to make a series of choices. Now, the diameter of those choices, or the magnitudes of those choices, literally become larger. The first one is, who am I and my relationship to God? Through that, now I have to step up into my feelings, my passions. Then I have to step up into the community. It says, can I go into the community, operate from a place of truth and transparency, which is also the, the world of honesty, on the other side of that is justice and equilibrium and harmony. Can I involve myself in the belonging of a community? The diameter just went from me to a community. Can I take that now I come into this beautiful place, which is the, the oxytocin of the pericardium, which is the heart level function. At the heart level function, first I've gone out in the community with my passion. Now I have my first experience of love one another. So now I can do the fourth lesson about the heart, which is to choose to express my harmony with God through my love of choosing to love other people. Now that process is the fourth level. Can I give and receive love with people? 
not only as people around me as friends, but can I have the singular experience of finding and knowing my soulmate and having a true experience where I am actually exchanging vital forces with one person. Now, are there 12 levels? Are there 12 rungs in the ladder? Because we keep coming back to 12s. And... There are six levels, two parts. That Par make... So they're parallel. Yes, parallel steps of the first six. Yes. We were conceived by God with the capacity for the first six. Mm -hmm. So I can live my whole existence as a bubble within the bubble and actually over thousands of years climb all of these levels up to level number six and become the perfect man. I can live in beautiful, unimaginable castles of abstraction or whatever you want to call them. I can be a perfectly evolved human being at level six. But, but that's the first six only. And then there's another six and another six and another six. There is a transition at seven. Hmm. The union with God is eight. Hmm. The union with God only occurs by the increase of divine love. Okay. Because only with divine love can I go past this limitation by, uh, by engaging my experience and the love of God and God's love for me, I go to level eight. So we skipped level five. We got to four, and level five is... We the... talked about it a little bit, but I'll give it to you again. It's about do no harm in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, don't pee that's, in any pool. That's after the union with an individual mate and exchange of essences at that level and then there's do level no harm, five is do no harm systems. in the world systems broader systems broader systems which mean geez how can i be involved in a government that uses my resources to bomb other people and how do i relate with that and cleanse that relationship what's my feelings about this and recognizing that until i continue to raise my own degree of love in combination with other people, the likelihood of it changing at five, which is an ecological love of all living things. It's a compassion for all living things, which means I will do nothing to kill anything. Sounds very Buddhist. Instead of repentance, they well, talk about renunciation, not just like giving things up, but like, you know, sex or food or something. They give up, they renounce a lot of things. Well, I'm, levels of I'm not sure about that aspect of it because I have no direct experience of it. But that level number five is I have a creative place in the world that is uniquely me. But my uniqueness doesn't violate anybody else's mm, right to be who they mm, are. Mm. And then six is the perfection. Now, six is the, it is the perfect man, but six has to do with spirit, which means... Do I have any philosophy or attitude within me that separates me from any soul on earth or any other place? Mm. Is it races, colors, creeds, or religion? Am I embodied in the umbrella of any religion that separates me from any other class or group of people? Do I have any umbrella at all about my relationship to God that separates me from other people. And these are belief systems, well, ways of being, this is expressions. This, this is a very large diameter. What's my attitude about spirit? What's my attitude about other discarnate souls around me all the time? By the way, we have on the average person from six to ten spirits with us all the time, coming and going in some form or another. So that we have discarnate spirits, and some of these spirits are earthbound spirits, and some of them are guardians or guides or uh, teachers in some form or another. And they're all, what's my attitude about them? What's my feeling about them? So this level number six is a spiritual world. And do I have in the slightest way a greater identity to one religious process that in any way provides a separation between me and my relationship to any other soul. Because those are that's a lack of humility, any one of those. That's correct. That's a barrier. And so as we as we move past those barriers, we arrive at level seven, which is a transition, you said. It's the transition of love. The transition of, through, by, with. It is a um, boundary of love. That the only way to pass through that boundary is to be literally 
embraced in the experience of divine love where my my yearning desire to be one with God is the force that pulls me through. It has to come from within me that I have a desire mm -hmm. to be in harmony with mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. Then the divine love is coming according to the magnitude of my own desire. As I go up into level 8, now I am in oneness with God. Now, oneness with God doesn't mean I know everything God knows. Doesn't, doesn't mean you lose your individuality. Not at all. Yeah, but there Actually, is a oneness, so you're an individual, but you're also at one with God. Now that substance inside me changes. Now I become celestial. This celestial experience gives me the capacity. Now I'm literally without any form of sadness or suffering ever again. I never need to in any form or another die in any form. I'm now continually in harmony with love. Now this gives me an unlimited capacity to go past level 8, which is not really where God is, but it's the first experience that goes beyond love that gives me the freedom to be able to engage in, explore, and discover according to my own soul's desire, not just carving little boats or playing the flute, but quite possibly making other universes. It's another level of expression. Really, it's playing the flute, but just yes. with a bigger instrument. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's level nine. Well, I, I'm not uh, sure. Uh, that's uh, that, that's past level eight, we'll, well just call it. I think that's well, a pretty good place to put it, a cherry on top here. It's, uh, <laughs> it's past my pay grade at the moment. Yeah, well, there's uh, we're working with that. Well, that this is the... This is the overview. I, so, this is all we're trying to do today. We didn't really get to the overview entirely, but we've got to the very nature of what the model looks like. And what would be the topics that we didn't touch on just for future reference? Well, we started to mention about the importance of the family tree and how the iris has composites of the individual positions and how these positions, we can actually learn to accelerate our appreciation through self-examination. We can use the iris to see, ah, I have an unresolved feeling, according to the map of the iris, mm -hmm. from this particular part of me that says, on the scale of one through six, was it an attitude about self-love? Was it an attitude about relationships? Was it an attitude about nature? Uh -huh. I need to be able to do this. So the birth order family tree dynamics. And that helps us with that self-examination and willingness to... It also helps us to discover softly some likelihood of our own passion. Because mm. each one of the birth order positions has a discrete way that it expresses itself in the world. So that's a larger discussion. And there's also a place where we have a loving opportunity to support our own children by recognizing what right. their unique quality right. is. Parenting. That's one of it. The other one in... Um, called the timeline, I was describing how the timeline from midnight to 12 noon, from 12 noon to midnight, this is what I call the line of everything. Because on this line is all the phases of the moon every month of the year, all of the phases of things of the 64 hexagrams. Everything along this line has all the colors, the frequencies, the body systems, glands. It's a really cool one to discover the cycles and seasons of how that works. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the, uh, the last part of this is to begin to comprehend that there is a truly magnificent topography of all the worlds to come. When we begin to, with some degree of clarity and truth, understand what each one of these different magnitudes of love looks like and how that there are specific lessons that we learn in level one. And by the way, this is level one. This is a... Well, not so easy place, because this is a hard place, but within level one, there's approximately a hundred other levels inside this one that are darker. So there are places, by understanding the topography of how the spirit world works, what are the rules to go from level number one to level number two, and how does it mm -hmm. operate? There's a whole series of really beautiful things that we can go into, and then we can come back to the, the, the how to do it all, which is the responsible and loving use of one's own free will. And that's about it for now. Very good. Well, Denny, as always, it's a pleasure and an honor, my friend. Glad to see you again. Tune in next time. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>